The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN 1510, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. This is KC Cares, Kansas City's nonprofit digital resource produced by Charitable Communications. We'll tell the stories of Kansas City nonprofits and the people behind them. KC Cares is proudly sponsored by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. I'm Ruth Bombigas. And I'm Bobby Keys. And for you folks who I know can't see it, he is sporting royal. Yes. Looks very handsome on oh, you. Awesome. Oh, I will take okay. a picture we will post. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll be on our social media, Instagram, face, Facebook, Twitter, the whole uh, the whole net. We'll give our address so people can find <laughs> us. Well, you just search Casey Cares online. That's as simple as that. She's over here taking pictures. That's... I'm taking pictures. He's smiling very nicely. <laughs> we have a power-packed show today, and we are so honored to have... The Congresswoman from the 3rd District of Kansas, Sharice Davids. Hello. It's Welcome. so nice to see you. Oh, I'm excited to be here. I mean, to see you in person, because I, you must have roller skates everywhere you go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> You're everywhere. Um, well, I do love roller skating. Uh, but, yeah, we. I feel very fortunate that I get the chance to go all over the entire 3rd District, whether it's Johnson County or Wyandotte County or that small portion of Miami County. Um, and just get get the chance to meet with folks and hear about the issues that are most important to people. Now, you were elected in 2018. Mm-hmm. New congressperson for us, first Native American woman from our district for sure, but mm-hmm. one of two, I believe, yeah, in Congress. So Deb Halland and I are the two, um, the first two Native American women to serve in the U.S. House which is in the history of the country, which is uh, pretty oh, wow. phenomenal. About time. Yeah, right? Another one of those about time <laughs> moments in our, <laughs> in our history. Since coming into office now, it's, it's not so far from a year of being elected. Yeah, the time is going by really quickly. <laughs> That's what you mentioned. It was like, you know, months seem like weeks. Mm-hmm. Have you been able to kind of settle into any kind of a rhythm? Um. I would say there, yes, there's a, there's definitely a rhythm to it. Um, it's, it is very fast and also, um, it's just because the learning curve is so steep every day feels really long. Um, (laughs) but you know, I, I've gotten into the groove of going to DC from, you know, I leave on Monday, I come back on sometimes Thursday evening or Friday morning, and then I'm here Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I go back to DC and I've started to get used to that schedule. And then occasionally we'll have a full week, a district work week. Um, and then right now we're on the August recess from voting. So it gives us an opportunity uh, especially the freshman members, I imagine, um, are, are doing similar things to what I'm doing, which is just going around and trying to uh, make sure to, to meet with as many people as possible. There's a lot of work that happens in the, in the district that, you know, constituent services work. We are doing roundtables, um, and we're just trying to make sure that we, that we cover all of that during this, during this month of August. Now you've worked in a you worked in a nonprofit arena before, mm-hmm. right? Now I guess when you're with your thought and kind of your motivation going into office and, mm-hmm. and doing what you're doing, is there is there is there is there more of a concentration on the nonprofit world, or just for you, or is that typically something that happens with with people in, in politics? Like it seems like right because you you started off doing that. Yeah, and, I did spend so actually. One thing I can say for sure is that the nonprofit work that I did was specifically focused on community and economic development work. Mm -hmm. And so I think that 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 has really shaped the way that I uh, look at my role as a legislator and as the representative for this district. And I think that's because, well, first of all, I, I think a lot of people who do work in nonprofits know that, you know, folks would sometimes ask, what's your you know, what do you, what's your title or what do you do? <laughs> and I would say, well, I'm the deputy director of this organization. And, uh, really what that means is I, I do whatever needs to get done for us to, you know, meet the mission or the goals that we've set out. And I think a lot of nonprofit folks know what that's like when you're both the person who's keeping the trains moving on time and, <laughs> and 
you know, taking care of operations, but you're also the person who has to fix the coffee machine if it breaks. Um, <laughs> we need to get a coffee yeah. machine. We don't even have Wait, one. Oh, you, you can go. afford a coffee yeah, machine? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, so, so I think that, so that, that was, that's been part of it, which is that I recognize that people are like really working super hard. And sometimes that means that they, depend on they're going to depend on our office to make sure that we're putting out the information about what kind of work our office is doing what do constituent services look like what is the legislation that we're working on or policies that we're working on right now because people don't have people don't always have the time it takes to learn about all of those things and and then the other piece is just recognizing that the best ideas, the solutions to some of the issues that we're dealing with, uh, um, you know, the the real in the weeds um, answers to the questions that we have as policymakers are not going to come from the United States Congress. Mm-hmm. They're going to come from the people who are actually on the ground doing the work every single day. And that was probably that is probably the biggest lesson that I took away from the time that I got to work in the nonprofit sector. And I think that it, it really informs the way that my office and the way that I look at, look at finding policy solutions. Mm. Do you think that gives you a leg up in a positive way? I I don't mean that in a politically, you know, running for office way, but that you have toiled in the soil of nonprofit. Yeah. I think what I think it does is, helps me really listen. And when I say that, I guess I'm thinking about there's there's a difference between me saying I think the best answers are probably going to come from from the community, from the people who are doing work in the community and um showing up in, you know, to talk to uh, a, a nonprofit or a community organization, um, you know, whether it's uh, the Salvation Army that we went and saw or, um, uh, you know, the uh, I don't know that I've, I've visited so many nonprofits <laughs> and I also don't want to. It's part of me is like, maybe I shouldn't say anybody's name because then I don't want to leave. People well, we, out. Lo- we love all nonprofits. Yeah, so if yeah. your name didn't get mentioned Please call us. You can be on the show. So yeah, that's I know not an issue. Happy bottoms out there doing stuff. And I mean, so we're so a lot of times what ends up happening is people say, "Oh, I want to, I want to hear what you have to say," and then they show up and they do all the talking. And I think that I've been the person in the room or the person who's been invited on behalf of my organization to come in and say, "Look, this is our experience," but then just to be talked to instead of entering into a dialogue. I think that having been on the other side of that is the thing that helps me really just stop and listen for a little while and ask questions that um, that sometimes help really get to the heart of an issue. How significant is the nonprofit sector or community in what you do and maybe what you've observed, you know, in your almost nine months or so in Congress? And is it different here than maybe other districts? Um, You know, what's interesting, that's a really good question. I need to ask, um, I need to ask some of my colleagues, you know, what their, you know, what their perception is of how uh, engaged or not they are with the with the nonprofit world in their, their districts. That's yeah. a really, that would be a really good uh, question for me to ask my colleagues. But I would say it is. I mean, I don't know percentage wise, but it does feel like, especially when you know something like healthcare is such a huge issue, um, whether it's uh, access. To healthcare, whether it's the costs, whether it's um, it, coverage, and 
a lot of the people who are doing the advocacy work around that are are nonprofits a lot of mm-hmm. times. And so, you know, whether it's like the Heart Associ- American Heart Association or um, the folks who are working on diabetes um, prevention and then also addressing issues after someone's already been diagnosed with diabetes. Um, I think a, I think a significant portion of the people who come into our office who are, frankly, they're trying to change the world. You know, they're trying to figure out a way to save lives, a way to increase education educational opportunities for people. Um, those, f- those folks are, are very active in, in our community and they're, they come into our office quite a bit. So, um, you know, climate, climate is a huge, um, issue that folks are trying to address. And we've got, you know, organizations or coalitions that are coming together around, around that. And, I wish I knew a percentage, but it feels like it feels like our nonprofit sector is very, very active here. Well, and it's it's the common, I guess, activity of both government and your particular office to be an advocate for the people you represent. Mm -hmm. And then on the nonprofit side, it's our job as nonprofits to advocate whatever the mission, the purpose, the goal. I think I was reading that you just recently were involved in... um, either a bill or at least a discussion about the cost of um, insulin and diabetes. Mm. You mentioned health care. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if you were getting bombarded, you know, by all those that work in that world. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it, it's been really interesting to um, just go. This whole experience has been just such a huge, huge learning experience. When I first launched uh, my campaign. And I think that February, if you would have asked me, what do you think the top issue is going to be? Um, I might, I might've thought that it would be something about climate. Um, and very quickly I saw that so many people are struggling around issues of, of healthcare access Mm -hmm. and, um, Diabetes is something that affects so many communities, um, whether it's type 1 or type 2, whether it's people who are being diagnosed later in life or very early in life. And um, there are so many people who don't have access to, um, they don't have health insurance. And then even sometimes when they do have health insurance, they're still butting up against uh, high deductibles. Their premiums are so high. And then if they're having to pay exorbitant amounts of money for the actual medications, it's having a really detrimental impact. And yes, tons of people are reaching out to our office about it. Um, we had a prescription drug cost panel, uh, or round table because so many people were reaching out and it, it just, it felt like we were hitting this critical mass of, of people where we realized if we had a, if we had a round table about this, we think that a lot of people would, would show up and be interested in it. I think over a hundred people came. I don't remember exactly, but, um, there were a lot of people there. And then one of the really amazing things that happens when we do these round tables is that we have folks who are, who come from a variety of spectrum, uh, of, of the issue that sit on those round tables. So we had a mom whose daughter was, um, has been impacted by diabetes and her, since so grace the daughter got diagnosed when she was five there has been a quadrupling of the cost of insulin oh, wow. since since then and she's 19 now sophomore in in college you know imagine how how that impacts when we talk about student loan debt you know how much Medical of the, loan debt yeah how much of the how much of that is because you're having to offset all these other costs because you're the cost of insulin which you need to live is being um is is quadrupled so, um, you know, we've got that kind of story. We've got uh, people who are working as pharmacists. We've got people who, um, you know, are administrators in a clinic or hospital setting. And then at the end of the of the roundtable, you've got all the people who are in the room who are trying to figure out how to address these issues. And they all get to talk to each other. They all get to figure out, like, well, what are you working on and what am I working on? And is there a way for us to collaborate? And um, so it's not just about me as a policymaker or legislator figuring out what are the things that I can be working on. It's also the folks in the community who can work together to try to um, make a change. What would your message be to the nonprofits that are 
hopefully listening to our show, but in the area, what is the best way then to engage with you in your office? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because I was thinking, um, I was thinking about this and I know a lot of nonprofits are doing, um, grant writing. So they're reaching out to the federal government and sometimes foundations around, um, trying to just trying to secure that funding so that they can continue the programming, um, that they're doing or research that they're doing. And our office can, um, can help through support letters. Um, so particularly if you're, um, trying to get a grant from the federal government, it, it, it helps to have a support letter from your member of Congress. And, um, so, uh, folks can reach out to our office um, just through the website davids.house.gov, and um, and we have somebody on staff who they they're the main person who works on support letters for grant for grant writing. Um, so that's one way that I think it, we can be helpful. The other way is to um, make sure to to reach out to our office and let us know about the issues, because I, I always ask people, please don't assume that our office already knows about a piece of legislation or how the funding is impacting right here locally, uh, because when when the appropriations process starts. My my job is to go out and advocate for us to get the, the appropriate amount of funding for these different programs. And uh, when people reach out to us and say, hey, you know, the, the, the diabetes research program is so important. Please make sure to, to fund it at this level. When they reach out and say that, it helps me make the argument to the appropriations committee. We need to keep this, we need to keep this research, these research dollars there because it's having a positive impact and here's how it's, how, how it's impacting the community that I'm, that I'm here to represent. So um, those are two ways that I think are, would be really effective. We thank you so much for taking time out for us and helping nonprofits understand how they can get in touch with you. And the fact that You've got a heart and soul for it because you've lived in this world, which yeah. is fabulous. We um, hope you'll come back again. And- yeah, I appreciate the invitation. And um, please in- invite me back. Inspired by Ewing, Mary, and Kaufman, the Kaufman Foundation believes that every person, regardless of their background, can take risks, achieve success, and give back to their communities. We work together with our Kansas City community and beyond through investments in education and entrepreneurship that create uncommon solutions. By listening first to the communities we serve, we seek to understand the problems and dream big with people to build innovative programs that deliver results. Ewing Kaufman worked hard to make Kansas City a major league city. We strive to continue that legacy today, challenging ourselves and our community to take calculated risks, solve problems, and help empower people to shape their future. Learn more at Kaufman.org. Folks, we're witnessing a huge supermarket event. Marriott Wood is about to break the frozen barrier. She's heading to the frozen fruit aisle. She's done it! Mary has broken the frozen barrier, and now she's filling her cart with all kinds of items, including antioxidant-rich wild blueberries. Mary, why all the frozen fruit and veggies? <sighs> because they're easy, affordable, and just as nutritious as fresh. And there are so many different kinds! There it is, folks. Mary has discovered an easy way to eat healthy every day. She's broken the frozen barrier. Now she's off to set a new record, getting through self-checkout. For more goodness in your diet, think colorful fruits and veggies. Fresh, canned, dried, 100% juice, and of course, frozen. Learn more at fruitsandveggiesmorematters.org. A message from Produce for Better Health Foundation. Inspired by you and Mary and Kaufman, the Kaufman Foundation believes that every person, regardless of their background, can take risks, achieve success, and give back to their communities. We work together with our Kansas City community and beyond through investments in education and entrepreneurship that create uncommon solutions. By listening first to the communities we serve, we seek to understand the problems and dream big with people to build innovative programs that deliver results. Learn more at Kaufman.org. What if your brother or your husband, what if your son came back from the service with a spinal cord injury? 
When they volunteer to serve, we expect our country to be there for them if they are injured. For more than 60 years, Paralyzed Veterans of America has been fighting to ensure that we receive all of the benefits that we've earned. Thank you, Paralyzed Veterans, for helping my husband. My son. For helping my brother. You too can help. Visit pva.org, a public service of Paralyzed Veterans of America. More than 100 million animals are illegally killed each year. Poaching is a major threat to our country's wildlife, but it's just one of the risks animals face. Pervasive and unprecedented destruction of their habitat threatens their very existence as development encroaches on our nation's remaining open spaces. The best way to protect wildlife is to protect the land on which they live. When we make their land safe and protect it from development, we help keep animals from extinction and defend fragile ecosystems. The Humane Society Wildlife Land Trust works with private landowners to protect wildlife by preserving natural habitats and establishing permanent sanctuaries. Curbing habitat loss is a daunting task, but one that must be undertaken to ensure that wildlife have the wild places they need to survive and thrive in perpetuity. To learn more, call 1-800-729-SAVE, that's 1-800-729-SAVE, or visit wildlifelandtrust.org. On today's episode of America's Least Wanted, the home invaders most likely to threaten your family are not human. Cockroaches can spread salmonella and trigger asthma attacks. Termites destroy billions of dollars in property each year. And stinging insects send half a million people to emergency rooms. Learn how to protect your family. Arm yourself with the facts at pestworld.org. A public service announcement from the National Pest Management Association. Welcome back to Casey Cares, Kansas City's nonprofit voice and digital resource, helping nonprofit organizations survive and thrive. I'm Bobby Keys, and I'm Ruth Bomb Biggis. And that was pretty cool. I, I've always, yeah. I was always a, a, a fan of her from the MMA. I'm a big fan of MMA. So having a cr- congresswoman uh, and a legislator that that's uh, that's you know she knows how to throw down, but not only in the on the mats, but in a nonprofit world. Right, which I thought was really, really interesting. The first time I had the privilege of hearing um, Congresswoman David speak, she talked um, a little bit more in detail about her work in the nonprofit community, which, you know, during a congressional race, those aren't always the big deep dive kinds of conversations. It's, you know, what are you going to vote on this or that bill? So I just thought that would be perfect. And she was very excited about coming in and talking about that aspect. So we'll have to have her back again. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we can do a fundraiser for a nonprofit that's MMA. And the two of you, nah, nah, nah. Nah, she whooped me. Wouldn't it be fun, though? <laughs> it sure would be fun. We have a great community asset with us, actually the people with that asset. And uh, we're talking with the folks with Farmers Bank of Kansas City. We are honored to have W.R. Robbins, who's the CEO and president. Welcome to Casey Thank Cares. Thank you very much. And with him, we have Jacinda Czar, who is the market president. Yes. So we have the real big chieftains of the bank here. Thank you. We want to learn a little bit more about the history of Farmers Bank. First, you are, like many nonprofits, ground up, you know, from people working together. Grass so roots. would you, grassroots, would you share a little of that with us? Yeah. I'd be very happy to. It's it's rewarding to know that the the name of the institution comes with quite uh, a, a, a reasoning behind it. Uh, many many years ago, out in the center of Kansas, uh, a bunch of farmers got together and decided they needed a bank, and and this was in 1907, and they mustered a whole ten thousand dollars together, <laughs> and that was the capital of the institution. And so they uh, started that little bank, and that was 112 years ago. Wow. And uh, it was purchased uh, uh, 45 years ago by the, the family, uh, myself. And uh, so uh, at that time, it, from 07 to, to uh, 71, it only grew $4 million in all that time. And since ownership in 71, why, we now are the 15th largest bank in the state of Kansas. Wow, congratulations. Wow, $850 million and, and uh, we're very, very much a financially strong institution. And we're very community bank oriented. We are a great community bank, and we do so much service 
in the nine bank area that we serve. Seven in the center of Kansas, below Hayes at a town called Great Bend, and then outlying towns around there. And then two in Kansas City, and the one in Kansas City is our big one at 143rd and Metcalf that Jacinda is the president and runs it for the last 10 years. And I'm the owner, and I just sit here in Kansas City and Johnson County <laughs> oh. and, you know, crack the whip. Oh, I, I don't think you just sit there. I hear you are moving and shaking. Like we told Congresswoman David, she needs roller skates. I think you need them, too, to get around and do all the things you do. Jacinda, tell us a little bit about the branch that's here in Overland Park and why nonprofit is important to you all. Sure. Uh, the, well, the branch here... Um, when I joined 11 years ago, um, we were about $65 million in size, and we've over tripled that size, and, and that's primarily done by um, serving our community with loans and deposit accounts. Um, but we really do focus on nonprofit. Um, we pick an organization each year, and then all of our staff will volunteer um, in that organization. We also... Every employee is allowed one day paid off a month to go volunteer. Oh, wow. And so um, it, it brings a lot of teamwork because a lot of times, like, for instance, next month, my credit analysts are all um, going together to a charity and volunteering. So it, it brings teamwork, but it also brings a positive morale to the institution. How big is the staff out at the Overland We're Park? small. We're small. We have about 19 full-time employees, So, um, but we... When we do volunteer, we um, try to work it around our schedule to make sure we have coverage in the facility. Um, and then everybody turns in their day a month that they want to do. And some employees don't participate, but the majority of employees do. So you don't want to hang that sign that says, sorry, we're closed, Rob, doing good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come back later. <laughs> Although that would be a really neat concept. Stop the day. All banks, stop and go out and do good work. Yeah. A, a go do good day. I like that. Say that 10 times fast. No, no, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> Debbie, R., why is involvement in the community, beyond being the financial institution, why is that important to you, it's your family important. and the yes, organization? And, uh, out in the center of Kansas, it's, it, it, it's uh, really a big project also, just like Jacinda has. In in the center of Kansas, in the town of Great Bend, which is county seat, and uh, – there, we do so many things. I have a page here, a, a list of two different, sh uh, of all the things that we're involved in. You know, like delivering the meals to those people that need it and, and on bank time. You know, this is all bank give. And, and uh, acknowledging uh, uh, Light Up a Child's Life, we give 300 gifts away every year uh, and deliver them to, to kids in need in the area. And just projects like that. And they're all so important. Because what they do is they show the community what we're about. Mm -hmm. We're not just trying to suck from the community. We're trying to give to the community. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a, an air or a flair that when people think about banking, they need to think about Farmer's Bank. The name itself m meaning uh, financial stability, strength, honesty. And that's, uh, th that's what, why when we came to Kansas City 20 years ago, we elected to bring the name with us mm -hmm. because it is emblematic of such of, of the honesty and, and integrity that farmers themselves organized, or had when they first started mm -hmm. the bank. And, and there's many, many banks in the state of Kansas that were named farmers, but none in Kansas City. We have the glory of being the only one in Kansas really? City. Isn't oh, that nice. interesting? Mm -hmm. I would have yeah. thought there would have been a plethora of farmers. Yeah. I, so I, I got a quick question. You know, with the, with being a, a more of a community driven you know organization and bank, did you what do you how does that affect like I guess uh, operationals? You know, from I guess deeper like attrition rates. Do when you, you when you have when you're hanging out with 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 uh, you know uh, or turnover. Like if you have uh, more people who are giving in the community, does, does it seem like they last longer? They stick they stick around because you're more community driven. Oh, absolutely. And let me give you a scenario. So my turnover in Kansas City, and this starts from my teller line mm -hmm. all the way up to my executives, 
Um, we've had zero turnover in six years. That's wonderful. See, and yeah. it it really works when you they realize you care about them as an employee, mm-hmm. and then you want that to pass that carrying on to the community. Yeah. Um, it really works. Like I said, it builds teamwork, but yeah. also builds. Um, we had one employee last year get an offer from one of our competitive banks. And one of the reasons she told us that she stayed was our ability to go volunteer. That's awesome. So a lot of the millenniums mm-hmm. love to volunteer, yeah. give back. And we knew that was, uh, you know, in hiring our younger staff, it, we knew it's it's a key point in getting good quality people. Yeah. That's it. Uh, along that same line, one of the reasons that we do gather good people is because they know we give and allow yeah. them to give mm-hmm. back on our time. Yeah. And uh, – people want to do that yeah and the fact that we allow that is very very uh, important yeah there's so much research that just is like people just want to be a part of an organization that's community driven and community exactly right. oriented mm-hmm. and if you allow that they're going to stick around longer they're, you're going to have a even a, 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 a better clientele in the long run it translates to bigger dollars over the, the a longer period certainly, of time certainly mm-hmm. uh, yeah. i'm always curious where people have that instilled in themselves, who your role models are. W.R., can you share a little bit about how your life was framed and why this was such an important thing in, in your business side of your life? Well, they, you know, it, it has to start at the top. And uh, in this case, since I've been there the, uh, over 45 years and, and built this, most of it, well, they look at me and say, what have you done? Well, if they, uh, my, my college is Fort Hayes University. And if you go up there and look, you'll probably find a name or two on buildings. And uh, we're, uh, uh, Jacinda helps me, and we're part of the, uh, the, the, pro- the uh, program of uh, the business and entrepreneurship is after us, too. And How we, great. We even go out there and teach uh, mm-hmm. once a year together in the classroom. And so we, uh, we believe, and so our, our employees see that. So they think, now, this, that's the pace that's being set. We're going to need to do something on our own in our communities, you know, all these nine communities that we uh, have banks in. So it serves as a very good role model, would you not say? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. How was it instilled in you? Did you have parents that modeled this? Was this something, was no, there I, any seminal moment in your life that said, yes, I get it? Absolutely not. I just determined myself to uh, be to try to achieve, and uh, uh, started out with nothing, uh, absolutely nothing, and got my first opportunity to work in a bank, and then to and then to uh, buy into a bank a little bit, and then to buy banks. So <laughs> I've been the last thirty years, thirty-five years buying banks. This giving back came as you became it's, successful it's in all business. A, all a part of it. Every community, I feel, every community we have to, we're in. We have to, we have to do the give back, and I, I insist on that. And the people that are running the banks in those areas, they they're very good. They want to give back too. Well, I know here in Johnson County, at least, and and the reach may be beyond the state line. Even I mean, I know banking can go over those state lines now. I know you've helped me at Salvation Army, Shadow Buddies, Johnson County Christmas Bureau. I mean, I for our listeners, I had a good page and a half list of all the things that you've been engaged with. How do you go about making those decisions? Nonprofits want to know what it's the secret. You know, how do you look at that and decide what you're going to support? Well, every year, you know, most businesses get asked for a lot of donations from so many nonprofits. And so we as a team come together and through our strategic plan, um, we will um, pick one charity a year. That is our focus. But then we ask our employees to work uh, that one day a month with charities of their choice. So, for instance, last year was Shadow Buddies. Mm -hmm. Um, This year is the Johnson County Christmas Bureau. Um, So we'll have opportunities. We'll attend the gala, and we'll have a large percentage of our donation dollars towards that charity. But we have a list of about 45 charities that all of the staff volunteer then throughout the rest of the year. So um, we just lead, and we we demonstrate from the very top how important – working with nonprofit is. And you also experience, like Shaney, 
in my experience. Yeah. So we have one fundraiser that we've done, and it's not really a fund; it's a charity. But um, Team Shaney, we created Team Shaney. We had a branch manager who was diagnosed with colon cancer. Mm. So um, in 2013, we created Team Shaney, and we do the colon cancer walk. And um, we have been the largest fundraiser um, since 2014. So at eight years in a row, we're the number one team for she fundraising. She passed on in 15. She I passed think. in 15. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, it, and, and she was the age of 45. Oh, my gosh. So it's been something that's been very dear to my heart. And when we started doing that, I realized the camaraderie with the employees, the leadership are provided, and Team Shaney is kind of what started the whole giving back in Kansas City. Just got a couple of minutes. What would you say to the nonprofits out there? Your phone might be ringing off the hook. But is there a way to engage with you all? What's the best way for them to possibly do that or approach you? So um, obviously, give us a call. You know, give us a call or stop by 143rd and Midcalf. Um, we would would definitely be interested in seeing if there's something we could provide to them for banking services because we have special nonprofit accounts that we can offer. Um, and also then we'd love to see if our employees could be a part of their team. I would also comment that each of them should go in and visit with their own banking institution and ask them what, what benevolencies they're involved in. Mm-hmm. Is there a chance we could get on the list, mm-hmm. you know? Try to form that relationship because they're not all going to bank with us. We'd like to have all of them we can, and, and we have we have special banking things for uh, nonprofit. Nonprofit. That's good to That's know. So idea. people yeah. can check that out at farmersbankks.com. Correct. Thank you for sharing yeah. your Thank story you. and your benevolence and your giving back. We so appreciate it. And You're thank you for welcome. what you do in the community. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Inspired by Ewing, Mary, and Kaufman, the Kaufman Foundation believes that every person, regardless of their background, can take risks, achieve success, and give back to their communities. We work together with our Kansas City community and beyond through investments in education and entrepreneurship that create uncommon solutions. By listening first to the communities we serve, we seek to understand the problems and dream big with people to build innovative programs that deliver results. Ewing Kaufman worked hard to make Kansas City a major league city. We strive to continue that legacy today, challenging ourselves and our community to take calculated risks, solve problems, and help empower people to shape their future. Learn more at Kaufman.org. When I was little, I didn't talk for a long time. I liked things to always be the same. Anything new or different would scare and upset me. I was very sensitive to lights and sounds. It was almost like I had bigger eyes and ears than everyone else. So I built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. I didn't like looking people in the eye. It made me feel uncomfortable. I'd throw big tantrums over little things like when my socks didn't match. Sometimes I'd do the same things over and over. Until one day, I found out I had autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I learned how to live with it better. You can see signs of autism in children as young as 18 months. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Jimmy Smith, and I'd like to talk to you about a screening. No, not a movie screening, but a screening test for colorectal cancer. It could save your life. Colorectal cancer is highly preventable, yet it is the second leading cancer killer of men and women in the U.S. But it doesn't have to be. Screening finds precancerous polyps so that they can be removed before they turn into cancer. So please... Get screened for colorectal cancer. I did. If you're 50 or older, get screened. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Inspired by you and Mary and Kaufman, the Kaufman Foundation believes that every person, regardless of their background, can take risks, achieve success, and give back to their communities. We work together with our Kansas City community and beyond through investments in education and entrepreneurship that create uncommon solutions. 
By listening first to the communities we serve, we seek to understand the problems and dream big with people to build innovative programs that deliver results. Learn more at Kaufman.org. I'm Howie Mandel. Did you know attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in adults is a real and treatable medical disorder? I know because I am one of the estimated 10 million adults in the U.S. who have ADHD. The symptoms of ADHD, inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity make it difficult to pay attention and focus, be organized, complete tasks, and maintain relationships. I've been diagnosed with ADHD. In my life, I've often misplaced things and have found it difficult to sit down and read a script for work or even have a conversation. You know, the kind when you're actually listening without interrupting. It's never too late for adults to seek help for ADHD and find the right treatment plan. Get information at adultadhdisreal.com and take an ADHD self-screener. Talk to your doctor. The right treatment plan can help control your symptoms so you can stay focused and organized, get things done at home and work, and help improve relationships. Visit adultadhdisreal.com to learn more about adult ADHD. Don't let ADHD prevent you from achieving your goals. I haven't. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. I opened a 401k. So you're giving up. Just like that. Giving up on what? On getting an inheritance from a distant relative. Don't you think if there were a billionaire in the family, we'd know about it by now? Listen to me. We are one phone call away from riding horses on our own private polo grounds. One call from christening yachts, having a butler, using summer as a verb. How do you figure? Look, everyone's got a rich uncle somewhere. It's statistics. So the best thing you can do is just prepare for the inevitable. Right. Which is why I thought maybe it would be smart to take control of my finances. You know, start using a budget, get out of debt, set some retirement goals. Budgets? Debt? You watch your mouth. Retirement shouldn't be a goal for us. It should be a way of life. When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Casey Cares, Kansas City's window on the nonprofit community and the people they serve. I'm Ruth Bon Biggis. And I'm Bobby Gies. And we have two gentlemen in the studio who I think do more than their share of helping yeah, tons. in the nonprofit community. And well, it, just incredible. It, just not, a, not a, just the community in general. Yes. Not, well, yeah. And one is a fellow Shawnee Mission South Raider. Yes, I'm sorry indeed. I could not <laughs> miss an opportunity for the alma mater. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. By the way, uh, check that. You have one gentleman here. He's the gentleman. I don't know that I qualify I for that staff. Oh, <laughs> I'm working on it. And you know that You're other voice. Like a gentleman, John. That other voice is none other than John Holt, WDAF Fox Four oh, wow. news anchor, former WIBW, and the pride of Great Bend and the Panthers. <laughs> so there you go. There I'm not a Shawnee Mission yeah. And <laughs> father of a West Point grad. See, I'm giving you all kinds of John Holt trivia. You know more than I do. <laughs> no, I knew the, the, the son no. and my daughter up at Omaha. Oh, yeah, Creighton, Creighton, Creighton grad, kids. Yeah. I mean, we've got all this. But more important, who cares about how I know them? <laughs> it's what Matt and John are doing together. And Matt, in, in addition to all his savvy in the business world, started the Head for the Cure Foundation. And you have your big event coming up. We but, do. Which is August 25th. yes. We are going to go back to the significance okay. of that date. Right. Let's you. get updated on Head for the Cure, where Great. things are at, and what's going on. You're making strides. Well, we are, and it it is it is uh, sometimes it feels like pushing a noodle uphill, but <laughs> but we are indeed pushing, and it is progressing. We've been Head for the Cure started with a, uh, our 5K in Kansas City in '03. We had 300 people raised twenty thousand dollars. The next year, we made a major step forward because John Holt, in year two, joined me on stage as the MC, and he and I have been doing this thing together for 16 years, and John's been on my board since we had a board, so about 10 years, so he's been a, a, a great supporter. But, but in the past few years, Ruth, we have made great progress. This year, we're going to do 28 events around the country. Wow. We're on pace to raise three, $3 million. We're impacting lives of people facing a of course, unwanted and unexpected diagnosis with a brain tumor. And a mm-hmm. malignant brain tumor is still a disease that is elusive to to clinical researchers and, clin- and, and, and the docs. So our work helps to push that forward. And this was so personal for you with yeah. your brother. It, it, it was and is. Yes. It is. Uh, no, it's, I mean, no and absolutely. Started. Yes. So my brother Chris uh, was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, which is stage four brain, brain cancer. Same thing that 
took the lives of of uh, several Royals folks, uh, uh, Dick Hauser, Dick Dan Quisenberry, and more notably, recently, I should say, not more notably, but recently, John McCain last year and Ted Kennedy years before him. Chris uh, Chris passed in 03 uh, at age 37, and he was a runner and a rider, and it was his idea to start the 5K, so it was an easy promise for uh, for us to fulfill. Promises get made, though. Not everybody has the bandwidth, shall we say, or the fortitude, because you've lost a loved one. It's not just, oh, okay, we're going to go start a multi-level, you know, city event. What was it that you know that it, really grabbed uh, you to say, yes, honestly, I'm going to do I, I this? Think, I think it was a, the the simple piece was that, you know, Chris had a belief that, as as all of us do who who live in this world to help others, which I think is the essence of why we're here. And Chris felt uh, through his diagnosis that if he could talk to one person that was facing the same thing and help them, that that would would be part of the explanation for why he's enduring it. And toward the end, he he simply asked me to help him help those people. And so it was that simple. And and then I, honestly, you know, no one does anything alone. That's for sure. And 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 I had uh, my company behind me at VML, people like John, who said, "Yeah, we'll help you." And and that. That's what made this thing continue to go forward. While Chris animates what we do, it's so much bigger than him, the thousands of people that we impact, and as he would expect and as he would want it. Well, and there was a recent article I saw in the Kansas City Star about a young woman. Yes. She's pretty young and is surviving, Yes, which is yes. pretty incredible. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, that was a great story the other day. And there are many survivors, of course. And in the time that we have been, have been plowing forward in hopes of, of defeating brain cancer, there have been great strides. Uh, it's incremental in many respects, but, but uh, incremental is necessary to reach the ultimate revolution. And, and cancer research, uh, uh, comes in 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 increments, and especially the most lethal cancers, and sadly, brain cancers among them. John, I know as a broadcaster and and in the community for a long time, everybody thinks they know you. So I'm mm-hmm. sure the phone rings off the hook. Oh, will you come do this? Will you come do that? Why was this head for the cure something you said? There's no doubt. I'm sign me up. Well, Matt and I were parishioners together, so we, we already had a, a relationship. And uh, when he took me to lunch, the, the, right, I think initially was persuasive, you wasn't were. It, initially it was to be the MC, then yeah. it was lunch to be a board member, then it was lunch a few years later when I thought I was going to escape the board because it was going <laughs> national and he wanted big time people. And he said, uh, would you stay on the board with me? You don't say no to this guy. And I'll tell uh-huh. you why, Ruth and Bobby, it's, it's his passion. I didn't know Chris, but I feel like I do now. It's Chris's spirit through Matt and his family that that make this thing work. And and literally, I was there on the on the ground floor with a, with a five k that maybe I had, think we had a, maybe four hundred people, four five hundred people yeah, yeah. to now over well twenty five hundred I think. Or uh, actually, we're already we're 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 pushing close to five thousand. See, I'm so behind. See, uh, here's a news guy. You're, the, the you're there, man. You can look will, out at the masses. It's but unbelievable it's, uh, what it's become. Yeah, and not only that, but as Matt said, all over the country now, this is a national foundation, a national board, um, assisting cancer centers around the country, including the KU Cancer Center, which is near and dear yes. to my heart. Uh, and so, yes, it was it was this guy's passion. You don't say no to that. Plus, you've had your own journey. I have a different type of cancer, right. but you know what. Cancer sucks, and yeah. and yeah. When, when you can when you can work for that cause to help people, no matter what they're dealing with, uh, that's what it's all about. So, the, you, you know, to see it grow yeah. it, it, with with that growth, what are some of the I guess some of the problems that you've kind of run you into? You know, it's uh, of course there are always growing pains. The the honestly, we <laughs> my glass is half full, so mm-hmm. so I tend to uh, to suppress the challenges and. Uh, Others might say, "Well, you just pushed that challenge. You took that monkey off your back and sure. threw it on mine." But, but I think establishing a cookbook, yeah. you know, a playbook, mm-hmm. and and then rolling it to other markets, and and being awake to the fact that not everything operates just the same way. Honestly, Kansas City, we've replicated what we do in Kansas City in many ways, but we we have not matched the numbers. It's our hometown. Mm-hmm. We have, we have great media behind us. This this interview, uh, John and I and others on our board have, have met a lot of people, so we have relationships. So those those things, uh, and and honestly, it was 
that recognition as much as anything to say, you know, we, we set new levels of success in every market. And recognizing in a nonprofit, one that is largely volunteer-oriented, we have a small staff, but uh, that every person and every dollar matters, whether it's 300 people, $40,000, or 5,000 people and $500,000, which is what we do in Kansas City. Every dollar matters. And so so it's, it's, it's staying awake to that and mm-hmm. to know that if you touch one person, as my brother Chris suggested was, was really, uh, you know, where the, where the value is, yeah. then you're making an impact. Yeah. And as it's grown national, the fascinating thing to me is to see, Matt, I think you'll agree, it started as a fundraising, friend-raising yes. thing. Now it's a fundraising advocacy yeah. and guide with Brains for the Cure, right. the, the, yeah. the new website that's been launched to help patients get through the process, okay. right? Not yeah. just research, yeah. Yeah. but also, okay, navigate, guide, help Give yeah, a resource. Yeah, Resor- that, yeah I was going to say that's resource. It. And that's what, and we, when we, when and I go back again to Chris, when he said, hey, if, 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 if we do a 5K, and he didn't live to be to that first year, man, promise me that, that the money you raise, if it's, and he didn't have any expectation, $10,000 that you'll plow it to research. So that's what we did, and that's what we've done. But we've redefined research. We realized that that it includes programs that help people that are they're currently fighting. And I, I want to say this, too, that, that John mentioned, uh, and he and I are actually in that same club, too, of, of, of survivors of cancer, but uh, there are thousands of causes. You know, your show here at Casey Cares supports lots of them. Thousands of causes. There are hundreds of cancer causes. Mm-hmm. They all matter. There are a few brain tumor causes. We're among them. So, you know, this big ecosystem and all these Venn diagrams of overlap matter. And But I think it's hard to support everything, as you guys right. know. But when you can focus and focus on, on bringing a solution to a group of people, finding solidarity, that that matters, and so as they all matter, and that, that's helped us. So we 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 pushed to research, we we pushed to programs, we created this navigator, which is really the one of its kind. Well, tell us field. about the navigator. Yeah. So John referenced it. So so we realized with any cancer, you know, when you learn your diagnosis, you stop hearing what the doctor says after that very point. Certainly, as a patient, as well the caregiver. And, and you try to dial in, you try to understand, and, and there are really three dimensions. What is it that, that I'm facing, understanding? What do I do, manage? And what will I do across my community over the long term, coping? So understanding, managing, coping. There is a gap there, and, and most of the available resources, and we're, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a Google away from finding an answer to anything, <laughs> but, but often the answers can be, can be um, confusing, diluting, and in the case of, of this disease, brain tumors, uh, most of the, of the information was clinical. So we wanted to do something that was more patient-centered, and so that's what Brains for the Cure is. It's designed in a, in a fresh, usable way, 200 videos, uh, video oh, wow. and audio, podcasts and, and video, create the ability to consume that information you know, in a in a more yeah. uh, sort of in your own on your own a friendly terms. way. In, yeah, three right. in the morning yeah. if you're doing so. It's um, and every step of the journey. Every step know, of the journey. Yeah. So and how diagnosis, folk- your treatment, right. so on and so forth. Exactly. How do folks find that? Find it. So brainsforthecure.org. So it sits uh, underneath, or it sits underneath inside the headforthecure.org website. Great. It's its own discrete environment called brainsforthecure.org, and and you know we keep the brands. It's my life's work, so you know we find the synergy <laughs> of those relationships. The brand guru. And the brands matter, and 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 that Google search engine. So yeah. you know what do I do if I have a brain tumor? Brains for the Cure will be one of the top engine, the, the top responses that come up. Significance of August twenty fifth. Yeah. So John, do you, th- this is uh, we discovered this last year, and of course, you know, John Station. Did uh, Fox Forward did did a piece on John McCain passed away August twenty fifth two thousand eighteen last year, mm-hmm. which was the eve of our event last year, which was August twenty fifth sixth August twenty sixth this year, 
coincidentally, our event, August 25th, is on the one-year anniversary of John McCain's death. And few people know this. It's, this is a, a spiritual reality, actually, that John McCain died the same day that his colleague, friend, warrior across the aisle, John the Republican, Ted Kennedy the Democrat, died of a glioblastoma brain tumor, oh, August 25th, 2009. And also, we're, we're in partnership here locally with the Esky family. Their son, Dustin Esky, a, as a 21-year-old, died mm. eight years ago on August 25th, 2011, uh, uh, 212. So it, it's quite remarkable. And I I, uh, I met Cindy McCain. I had breakfast with her in New York City a, a couple Lucky months ago. Lucky Cindy McQu- McCain to get to have breakfast with you. It was you. awesome. She is something, but, a, but an amazing lady. And she talked about the, part, the relationship between John McCain and Ted Kennedy. It was cool. And, John, you, you called this out last year. It's, uh, what would you say about this? Well, it's an amazing coincidence, yet maybe it's not. You know, maybe there's a reason. Well, and I, when you throw in the Esky family and the wonderful support they've provided for Head for the Cure and brain <coughs> tumor patients, um, it's it's a terrific, uh, like it's almost spiritual it kind of spiritual. thing. Yeah, I think that you know, I mean, I don't want to. It, it's there. Are, there there are people out there that say there are no coincidences. That this is, I think, uh, you know, proof positive that maybe that's that's the Stars case. Aligned. It's uh, yeah. it's quite amazing. Actually. So we know that you've got the the run coming up. How can people engage with you year round? Oh my gosh, that that is that's a great question, Ruth. Thank you. It's so we are in this day and age, we are hyperactive on on social media. We do maybe 40, 50 events during the year, from a give back wow. at Chicken and Pickle to to Survivor events in partnership with KU Cancer Center to uh, golf tournaments. To we we stay really active. So. Our Facebook page, our Twitter pages are, are light up pretty well. All that information is on HeadForTheCure.org to find out what's going on to support this community. Thank you both so yeah, much for you. what you're doing. We're going to knock it down. We are. Because of your efforts. Put us out of business. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> that is, <laughs> that is a life goal for sure. We want to thank you for listening to Casey Cares, Kansas City's nonprofit digital resource produced by Charitable Communications, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Casey's Cares is generously underwritten by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. Casey Cares podcasts are available at CaseyCaresOnline.org. To be a guest on Casey Cares or for underwriting opportunities, please visit CaseyCaresOnline.org. You can spread the love and find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Casey Cares Online. And thank you for listening to Casey Cares on ESPN 1510 AM and 94.5 FM. ESPN Kansas City is KCTE Independence and K233 DM Raytown. 1510 AM, 94.5 FM.